So the topic for this video is the second derivative test. So we're going to prove the results of the second derivative test, which is something that I'm sure you're all familiar with from calculus. You will have used it before in calculus courses. Now I'm aware that I have entitled this video the second derivative test, and there is a risk that some 16-year-old calculus students come across it, hoping for a calculus level explanation of this. If that is you, be warned, that is not what this video is. This is an analysis video and we're going to prove what the second derivative test says here rather than introduce you to how to use it. So let's begin with a bit of terminology that you should be familiar with from calculus. So let's say that we've got some function defined on the open interval a, b and it's a real valued function. Now I've just actually um, taken to using the open interval here rather than the closed interval because actually if you use the open interval, you get around the problem of the endpoints, because the endpoints, if you have them, you have to consider them as a special case, because if you're thinking even just about continuity, you've only got the one-sided limits for the endpoints. And then if you're thinking about derivatives, again, you've only got the one-sided limits. So you have to then consider the endpoints as special cases. Whereas if you just think about the function being defined on an open interval rather than a closed interval, you get around having to consider those special cases because you don't have the two endpoints. So that's why I've just moved to using open interval here, just to avoid uh, having to think about the boundary points as special cases. Then, if you've got some x0 within the open interval, so some point inside the open interval where the function is differentiable and the derivative is equal to 0, then we call that a stationary point. So we say that the function f uh, has a stationary point at x0, or x0 is a stationary point for the function f. So that terminology is hopefully familiar to you from calculus. Now the second derivative test is about stationary points and making conclusions about the nature of those stationary points using the second derivative. So in order for you to be able to do this, the function does need to have a second derivative at the point x0. So you need the second derivative to exist at this point x0, which is the stationary point that we're talking about. And if that is the case, you can use the value of this station the, sorry, the value of this second derivative to infer things about the stationary point. Now, of course, there are examples of functions where they have a stationary point, but the second derivative doesn't actually exist at that stationary point. So here's an example here, uh, which is the function f of x defined by it's equal to x squared on the non-negative real line. So for x is greater than or equal to zero, it's equal to x squared. And then for the negative numbers, it's equal to minus x squared. So rather than x squared coming up here, it's actually equal to the negative of that. So it goes down like so. So this function is going to be, well, it's firstly defined on the entire real line. And it's going to be differentiable, in fact, everywhere on the real line. Now, it's easy to see that it's differentiable for all the positive numbers, because for here, the function is just x squared, and x squared is differentiable. And it's easy to see that it'll be differentiable for all the negative numbers, because again, the function is just minus x squared there, which is also differentiable. The only question is, is it differentiable at x is equal to zero, which is this danger point where we're suddenly moving from one function to the other? Now the answer is yes, it is differentiable at zero, and to understand why, remember that what we need to convince ourselves of is that the limit as h approaches zero, and abandon this plus for a moment, of the difference quotient f of x plus h minus f of x over h, that this exists. Now this limit will exist if both the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit exist. So if the two one-sided limits exist, and they're equal to the same thing, of course, that's the other thing that you need. So the two one-sided limits need to exist, and they need to be equal to the same thing. If that is the case, then the overall limit will exist. So let's think about the right-hand limit. Well, from the right, the function is just equal to x squared. So we know that x squared is differentiable at x is equal to zero. So its right and left-hand limit if the function was equal to y is equal to x squared on both sides, um, are, exist, and they're equal to one another. And of course, we know that the derivative of that is 2x, so substituting x is equal to 0. So the derivative at 0 is 0. So therefore, this right-hand limit must exist, because it's the same as the right-hand limit for that function, where it's just 
x squared on the entire real line. Now think about the left-hand limit. Now it's important to note that these two functions, or these two different function rules here, actually agree at x is equal to zero. So if you put in zero here and zero here, you get the same answer, they're both zero. Um, so actually, I've put that this is the one we're using at x is equal to zero, but we could have done it the other way around. We could have just had this as x is strictly greater than zero, and this as x is less than or equal to zero. So actually, when you're considering the left-hand limit, so put a minus here now, we're just using this function rule here. And again, same argument, this function minus x squared, this is differentiable at x is equal to zero if we use this function for the whole real line. And therefore, the right and left-hand limits of the difference quotient at x is equal to zero must exist and they must be equal to one another. And this left-hand difference quotient for our compound function here is just going to be the same as that left-hand limit for the function minus x squared. So that left-hand limit in the case of minus x squared, of course, is equal to zero. So we now have that the right-hand limit of our compound function exists and is equal to zero, and the left-hand limit of our compound function exists and is equal to zero. Therefore, they both exist, and they're both equal to the same thing. Therefore, the overall limit of the difference quotient exists, and it's equal to zero. So this function is differentiable at x is equal to zero, and its derivative is zero. So this compound function, therefore, does have a stationary point at x is equal to zero. f prime at zero is equal to zero. However, the second derivative of this function does not exist at x is equal to zero, and therefore it's an example of a stationary point where you cannot possibly use the second derivative test. That's the whole point of discussing this example, to just illustrate that, you know, there are examples of functions where there are stationary points where the second derivative doesn't even exist at that stationary point, so you've got no hope at all of being able to use the second derivative test. So to illustrate that this function does not have a second derivative at x is equal to zero, what I've done here is I've plotted f prime against the real numbers. So if we think about what f prime is, so for the positive real numbers, it's simple. We just differentiate x squared, so we'll get that f prime is equal to 2x for the positive real numbers. For the negative real numbers, we just differentiate minus x squared, so we'll get minus 2x. And then we know at x is equal to 0, it's got the value 0. So then if we plot this, this is um, the line y is equal to, uh, or f prime, if we're calling the y-axis f prime, f prime is equal to 2x. This is the line f prime is equal to minus 2x, and then it's 0 here. And you can see that you have a corner there. This function is not going to be differentiable at x is equal to 0, and therefore the second derivative of our function doesn't exist at x is equal to 0. So here's an example of a function with a stationary point, but the second derivative does not exist at that stationary point. So let's return now to the second derivative test. So let's say we have our function and we have a stationary point at this uh, value x0. And let's say that the second derivative does exist for the function at that value x0. Then from the value of the second derivative, you can infer things about the nature of this stationary point. So in particular, if the value of the second derivative at x0 is greater than 0, then you can conclude that the function has a local minimum at your point x0. Now, what does local minimum mean? It means that there will exist an interval around your point x0, and it might be an absolutely tiny interval, an absolutely tiny epsilon or delta, whichever symbol you want to use, interval around x0. But there will exist some interval around that x0, such that if you look at all the points inside that interval, uh, apart from x0 itself, then all of their values or all of the values they're being mapped onto by the function will be greater than the value that x0 is being mapped onto, i.e. there is an interval where all the other points around the point x0 in that interval are being mapped onto something above x0 by the function, i.e. where x0 is the minimum uh, of the function in that little interval. So I've written that out here. So there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that for all the points x inside the epsilon interval around x0, so the interval x0 minus epsilon to x0 plus epsilon, open interval, uh, where 
I'm not including the point x0 itself, so you pick something inside this interval that isn't the centre point x0 itself, then if you look at what those points are being mapped onto by the function, it is greater than f of x0, i.e. within this interval, x0 is the minimum of the function, i.e. it's a local minimum. That's what being a local minimum means. Now, just to introduce you to a bit more terminology, um, we can call this an epsilon interval, but another name you might hear me use is also epsilon neighbourhood. This is a good word to get used to because it is going to come with us into much, much more advanced parts of analysis, and analysis is more scary brother called topology as well. So it's good to get used to this word neighbourhood because if you go to more advanced pure maths, you're going to hear it a lot. In basic one-dimensional real analysis, if I say epsilon neighbourhood, it just means an epsilon interval around the point. So an epsilon neighbourhood of x0 is just this, an epsilon interval, an open epsilon interval around the point x0. So you might hear me use that word, um, call this an epsilon neighbourhood of the point x0. So all the points in this neighbourhood of x0 are being mapped onto something greater than what x0 is being mapped onto. So that's what you can conclude if the second derivative at your stationary point is greater than 0. If your second derivative at your stationary point exists and is less than 0, you can conclude the opposite. You can conclude that the function has a local maximum at your stationary point. And I haven't written this out, but of course what that means is that there exists an epsilon interval or an epsilon neighbourhood around the point x0 such that for all the points in that interval, apart from x0 itself, they are mapped onto something by the function that is less than the value that x0 is mapped onto, i.e. that in that interval, x0 is where the function obtains its maximum. Now, you will, of course, be aware from calculus that in the case where the second derivative is equal to zero at your stationary point, you can't conclude anything. Let me just remind you of the examples that demonstrate that you can't conclude anything. So one of the major ones, of course, is y is equal to x cubed. So this function defined on the entire real line is differentiable over the entire real line with derivative 3x squared and with second derivative 6x. Now, it has a stationary point at x is equal to 0. That's its only stationary point. So you can see that if you put x is equal to 0 here, you get that the derivative is equal to 0. But you'll also see that the second derivative at x is equal to 0 is also 0. Now, this stationary point is neither a local maximum nor a local minimum because if you consider any neighbourhood or any interval, open interval around x is equal to 0, you can see that on the... Uh, part of that interval that is to the right of zero, so this side, the function is always going to be greater than it is at x is equal to zero. And by the way, the function, of course, is zero at x is equal to zero. So it's bigger on this side. And then on the left-hand side of the interval, so the part that's to the left of zero, the function is less than it is at x is equal to zero. So any interval you take, it's not going to be true that the function obtains its maximum or minimum at x is equal to zero over that interval. So this is neither a local maximum nor a local minimum. Now, before you get excited and conclude that if the second derivative is equal to zero, then it's the case that the stationary point is neither a man minimum or a maximum, that's not the case either. So here's another example. Consider the function y is equal to x to the power of 4. So again, this is a function defined over the entire real line. Its derivative is, uh, well, this is its graph, firstly. It's a steeper version of y is equal to x squared, graphically looking. Um, and... Its derivative is equal to 4x cubed. Its second derivative is equal to 12x squared. Now, you'll note that it is equal to 0 at 0. It has a stationary point at x is equal to 0, so its derivative is 0 here. But if you look at what its second derivative is at 0, it's also equal to 0. Now, here, clearly, um, this stationary point is a minimum of the function. It's, in fact, a global minimum of the function. Um, but the second derivative test is not able to tell us that. So here is an example where the second derivative is equal to zero, but it is a global minimum, in fact, but you're not able to infer that from the second derivative test. So we had an example here where the derivative, the second derivative was zero and 
it wasn't a maximum or a minimum. We have an example here where the second derivative is equal to zero and it's a global minimum. And now I'll just show you an example of where the second derivative is equal to zero and in fact it's a global maximum. So an example of this is just take the negative version of this. So take y is equal to minus x to the power of 4. So graphically this looks something like this. If we take the derivative of this, it's minus 4x cubed. If we take the second derivative of this, it's minus 12x squared. So you can see that the function does have a stationary point as x is equal to 0. The derivative is 0. And the second derivative at that stationary point is also equal to 0. However, that stationary point actually represents a global maximum in the case of this function. So this completes the demonstration that when the second derivative is equal to zero, you cannot conclude anything because we've got an example where the second derivative being zero is occurring in the case of a global maximum stationary point. We've got an example where it's occurring in the case of a global minimum stationary point, And we've got an example of where it's occurring in a stationary point that is neither a local maximum nor a local minimum. So I've rubbed that out now. These are the things that you can safely conclude by the second derivative test, that if the second derivative is greater than zero at a stationary point, then you can conclude that that stationary point is a local minimum, and that if the second derivative is less than zero at a stationary point, you can conclude that stationary point is a local maximum, and we're going to prove this in this video. We're also going to prove the partial converse, which is that if you have a stationary point, and you know the second derivative exists, and you know that the stationary point is a local minimum, then you can conclude that the value of that second derivative must be greater than or equal to zero. Now, this is only a partial converse, because the full converse would be that you know that the second derivative is strictly greater than zero. But we know that that can't be true, because I've just given you an example of a function where the stationary point is a minimum, where the second derivative is equal to zero rather than being strictly greater than zero, namely that function y is equal to x to the power of four, where it wasn't just a local minimum, it was a global minimum, but a global minimum is certainly a local minimum. Uh, similarly, if you have a stationary point, you know the second derivative exists, and you know that that stationary point represents a local maximum, then you can conclude that the value of the second derivative must be less than or equal to zero, not strictly less than zero, but less than or equal to zero. And again, we know it can't be that we can conclude that it's strictly less than zero because I've given you an example of a function where the stationary point was a local maximum, y is equal to negative x to the power of four, but the second derivative there was zero rather than being strictly less than zero. So we'll have a break here, and in the next video we'll start proving this direction, and then after we've done with that, we will uh, prove this partial converse as well.